All right, guys, so I'm going to be reading chapter one of Things Fall Apart. I'm actually going to show you the PDF for those of you who do not have the PDF, oh, I'm sorry, not have the book online. So I'm going to be reading chapter one. I hope that you will open your book and that you will read through it as I read through it. That will help you guys with the beginning of the story, and I'll do a little bit of explanation at the end. So I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to go here. All right, so we are in part one, chapter one. Okonkwo was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements. As a young man of 18, he had brought honor to his village by throwing Amelines the cat. Amelines was the great wrestler who for seven years was unbeaten from Umafoya to Mabueno. He was called the cat because his back would never touch the earth. It was this man that Okonkwo threw in a fight, which the old men agreed was one of the fiercest since the founder of their town engaged a spirit of the wild for seven days and seven nights. The drums beat and the flutes sang and the spectators held their breath. Emmeline's was a wily craftsman, but Okonkwo was as slippery as a fish in water. Every nerve and every muscle stood out on their arms, on their backs and their thighs, and one almost heard them stretching to breaking point. In the end, Okonkwo threw the cat. That was many years ago, 20 years or more. And during this time, Okonkwo's fame had grown like a bushfire in the Harmonin. He was tall and huge, and his bushy eyebrows and wide nose gave him a very severe look. He breathed heavily, and it was said that when he slept, his wives and children in their houses could hear him breathe. When he walked, his heels hardly touched the ground, and he seemed to walk on springs, as if he was going to pounce on somebody. And he did pounce on people quite often. He had a slight stammer, and whenever he was angry and could not get his words out quickly enough, he would use his fists. He had no patience with unsuccessful men. He had had no patience with his father. Onoka, for that was his father's name, had died 10 years ago. In his day, he was lazy and improvident and was quite incapable of thinking about tomorrow. If any money came his way, and it seldom did, he immediately bought gourds of palm wine, called round his neighbors, and made merry. He always said that whenever he saw a dead man's mouth, he saw the folly of not eating what one had in one's lifetime. Onoka was, of course, a debtor, and he owed every neighbor some money, from a few calories to quite substantial amounts. He was tall but very thin and had a slight stoop. He wore haggard and mournful look, except when he was drinking or playing his flute. He was very good on his flute, and his happiest moments were the two or three moons after the harvest when the village musicians brought down their instruments hung above the fireplace. Anuka would play with them, his face beaming with blessedness and peace. Sometimes another village would ask Anuka's band and their dancing Igwugu to come and stay with them and teach them their tunes. They would go to such hosts for as long as three or four markets, making music and feasting. Onaka loved the good fare and the good fellowship, and he loved this season of the year, when the rains had stopped and the sun rose every morning with dazzling beauty. And it was not too hot either, because the cold and dry Harmadan wind was blowing down from the north. Some years the Harmadan was very severe, and a dense haze hung on the atmosphere. Old men and children would sit would then sit round log fires, warming their bodies. Onoka loved it all, and he loved the first kites that returned with the dry season, and the children who sang songs of welcome to them. He would remember his own childhood, how he had often wandered around looking for a kite sailing leisurely against the blue sky. As soon as he found one, he would sing with his whole being, welcoming it back from its long, long journey, and asking it if it had brought home any lengths of cloth. That was years ago, when he was young. Onoka, the grown-up, was a failure. He was poor and his wife and children had barely enough to eat. People laughed at him because he was a loafer and they swore never to lend him any money because he never paid back. But Anoka was such a man that he always succeeded in borrowing more and piling up his debts. One day, a neighbor called Okoi came to see him. He was reclining on a mud bed in his hut playing on the flute. He imme immediately rose and shook hands with Okoi, who then unrolled the goat skin, which he carried under his arm and sat down. Anoka went into the inner room and soon returned with a small wooden disc containing a cola nut, some alligator pepper, and a lump of white chalk. I have cola, he announced when he sat down and passed the disc over to his guest. Thank you. He who brings cola brings life, but I think you ought to break it, replied Okoe, passing back the disc. No, it is for you, I think, and they argued like this for a few moments before Anoka accepted the honor of breaking the cola. Okoe, meanwhile, took the lump of chalk, drew some lines on the floor, and then painted his big toe. As he broke the cola, Onaka prayed to their ancestors for life and health, and for protection against their enemies. When they had eaten, they talked about many things, about the heavy rains, which were drowning the yams, about the next ancestral feast, and about the impending war with the village of Mubano. Onoka was very happy when it came to wars. 
oh, sorry, Onoka was never happy when it came to wars. He was in fact a coward and could not bear the sight of blood. And so he changed the subject and talked about music, his face beaming. He could hear in his mind's ear the blood stirring and intricate rhythms of the Kiwi and the Udu and the Ojini. And he would hear his own flute weaving in and out of them, decorating them with a colorful and plaintive tune. The total effect was gay and brisk, but if one picked out the flute and it went up and down and then broke into short snatches, one saw that there was sorrow and grief there. Okoli was also a musician. He played on the Ojini, but he was not a failure like Onoka. He had a large barn full of yams and he had three wives, and now he was going to take the Edemili title, the third highest in the land. It was a very expensive ceremony and he was gathering all of his resources together. That was in fact the reason why he had come to see Anoka. He cleared his throat and began, <clears throat> Thank you for the cola. You may have heard the title I intend to take shortly. Having spoken plainly so far, Okoe said the next half, a dozen sentences in Proverbs. Among the Ibu, the art of conversation was regarded very highly, and Proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten. Okoe was a great talker, and he spoke for a long time, skirting round the subject and hitting it finally. In short, he was asking Anoka to return the 200 calories he had borrowed from him before, for more than two years before. As soon as Anoka understood what his friend was driving at, he burst out laughing. He laughed loud and long, and his voice rang out clear as the Ojini, and tears stood in his eyes. His visitor was amazed and sat speechless. At the end, Anoka was able to give an answer before fresh out, between fresh outbursts of mirth. Look at the wall, he said, pointing at the far wall of his hut, which was rubbed with green, with red earth so that it shone. Look at those lines of chalk, said Okoe, and Okoe saw groups of short perpendicular li lines drawn in the chalk. There were five groups, and the smallest group had ten lines. Anoka had a sense of the dramatic, and so he allowed a pause, in which he took a pinch of snuff and sneezed noisily. Then he continued, each group there represents a debt to someone, and each stroke is 100 calories. You see, I owe that man a thousand calories, but he has not come to wake me up in the morning for it. I shall pay you, but not today. Our elders say that the sun will shine on those who stand before it shines on those who kneel under them. I shall pay my big debts first. And he took off another pinch of snuff, as if it was paying the big, as if he was paying the big debts first. Okoi roid, rolled up his goatskin and departed. When Anoka died, he had taken no title at all, and he was heavily in debt. Any wonder, then, that his son Okonkwo was ashamed of him. Fortunately, among those people, a man was judged according to his worth and not according to the worth of his father. Okonkwo was clearly cut out for great things. He was still young, but he had won fame as the greatest wrestler in the nine villages. He was a wealthy farmer and had two barns full of yams, and he had just married his third wife. To crown it all, he had taken two titles and had shown incredible prowess in two intertribal wars. And so, although Okonkwa was still young, he was already one of the greatest men of his time. Age was respected among his people, but achievement was revered. As the elders said, if a child washed his hands, he could eat with kings. Okonkwa had clearly washed his hands, and so he ate with kings and elders. And this was how he came to look after the doomed lad who was sacrificed to the village of Umafoya by their neighbors to avoid war and bloodshed. The ill-fated lad was called Ikimifuna. So I am sorry about butchering all these names, guys, but I do want you guys to pay attention to the, the description, the contrast between Onoka and Okonkwo. Okonkwo is our main character, and Onoka is his father. And that, basically, the society reveres hard work, and his father was not a hard worker. And so this has set, um, this has set Okonkwo up for success because he has motivation to make money and to be somebody because his father was not. So we'll talk more about that later.